This video will give an introduction to the history and techniques of photography. In the 5th century BC, we see the first written record of the camera obscura, which is where photography finds its origins. This is a dark chamber with a hole in one wall where sunlight can pass through, and it actually projects an inverted image onto the other side of the chamber. The hole where the sunlight comes through is so small that sometimes it's called a pinhole camera, and this device is the forerunner of the modern camera that we see today. Another written record happens in the year 1000, wherein Muslim scientist Ibn al-Haytham wrote of a prototypical camera that he used to view eclipses safely. Moving on to 1585, a mathematician named Giambattista della Porta improved this device by putting a lens in the pinhole, and in doing so, this created a sharper image. By the 17th century, artists have started to use this technology to help them with drawing. This is done because the image is projected onto a surface, and then they use that as a guide. But at this point, there's no real means of preserving or copying these images. They just exist as projections. In the early 19th century, scientists are able to coat certain surfaces with photosensitive chemicals in order to record these images. The first rough images were recorded and fixed onto a sheet of pewter, and the image was created by exposing sensitized metal plates to natural light for several hours. Louis Jacquemont Daguerre created a process called the daguerreotype in 1839. The image is created by taking an iodized silver plate and introducing it to a mercury vapor before exposure, after which the image is fixed to the plate with a mineral salt solution. So utilizing this chemical photosensitivity with the box size camera obscura that we just talked about, this was the first process that had repeatable, predictable results. That said, due to the long exposure times, it could only capture stationary objects, which made it very difficult to capture humans. The example that we see here is the first recorded photograph to capture a human. If you look in the bottom left third of the image, you can see a man sitting, and he actually sat long enough to be exposed into the photo because he was getting his shoe shined. Moving on to the mid-19th century, the technology was vastly improving. There were shorter exposure times, the chemicals used were less toxic, and this resulted in a rise in popularity of the medium. And as a result, there was a new demand for portraiture. Previously, portraits had been painted, so it was usually reserved for the wealthy who could afford to commission an artist to sit and paint them for hours at a time. And while photography was way more affordable to the middle class, it did still borrow some of the formal qualities of the portrait painting that came before it. Moving on to the modern camera, there's still a great resemblance to the traditional camera obscura. Light is still passing through a pinhole onto the back wall of a dark chamber. This inverted image is now hitting an image sensor, which is a chemically treated plate or chemical film inside the camera. If you look in the image here, it's on the far right, in the back of the camera. In digital cameras, the light from the image is then converted into an electric charge. While the lens functions very similarly to the pinhole, the aperture is what denotes the size of that opening. And it's measured in terms of the f-stop. The f-stop is a ratio of the focal length to the size of the opening. So a higher f-stop will have a narrow aperture, which lets in very little light, and you use this in bright conditions. So if it's a really sunny day, you don't want to overexpose your film, so you want a tiny little hole. And the inverse is also true. A lower f-stop has a wider aperture, letting in more light, and this is used in low light settings. There's not a lot of light, so you want to let more in so you get a proper exposure. The focal length is the distance between the lens and the sensor. In adjusting this, the lens moves inward or outward, and in doing so, it determines whether the camera takes in a wide or a narrow view. The depth of field describes the area that will be in focus for the image, from the nearest to the farthest area that will appear sharp. And this is determined by the f-stop, so a lower f-stop, the shorter the depth of field. The shutter speed is exactly as it sounds. It's the amount of time that the shutter remains open to let in light. So if it's open for a longer amount of time, it'll let in more light, less time, less light. Keeping that in mind, not all photography is done with a camera. 
When seeking out means of reproducing his notes, astronomer John Herschel created the cyanotype in 1842. This process was also called the shadow graph because it involved taking a paper coated in light-sensitive chemicals, putting objects on top of it, and exposing it to the sun. During exposure, the sun is not able to reach wherever these objects are casting a shadow. So while everywhere else is turning a dark blue color, the areas that are not exposed to the sun, blocked by the object, will remain the white color of the paper. Engineers often use this process to create fast and cheap reproductions of their notes and their designs. Wherever they had made a mark for their text or for their drawing would block the sunlight and create white lines. Everywhere else was exposed to the sun and would darken to the blue color, giving it its nickname of a blueprint. In 1843, Anna Atkins created the first photographically illustrated book using this process. The book, Photographs of British Algae, superseded William Henry Fox Talbot's Pencil of Nature, which was printed in 1844. I make this comparison solely because his book was previously believed to be the first. And while that's not true because of Atkins' book, Pencil of Nature was the first to be reproduced on a commercial scale. Now we're going to move away from the technical aspects and more so into photography as an art form. Initially, it was challenged by the general public because it relied on a mechanical device, which many believe didn't make it art. And even some photographers agreed and used it solely to record visual information. We see this start to shift with the portraits of Julia Margaret Cameron. Her photos were very expressive, using exposure times that define details like faces and clothing. She also pioneered the use of close-ups and very controlled lighting. In doing so, she enhanced the images of her subjects. Cameron also experimented with model positioning and compositions in order to create different atmospheres. Now we have artists like Alfred Stieglitz who were major proponents in the photography as art movement. Stieglitz founded a photo gallery in New York in 1905 and he also founded the photo magazine Camera Work. Like other photographers of the time, he too was influenced by the formal qualities of paintings and really saw himself as their equal. So again, within his personal work and the works that he curated and exhibited, he presented photographers as being just as skilled as painters in capturing and interpreting the world around them. Photographer Henry Cartier-Bresson focused on capturing a single decisive moment. In order to do this, he tried to release his shutter at the exact right moment with the perfect shutter speed. In the example that we see here on the left, he was able to capture someone mid-jump as they leapt over a puddle. Another artist, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, utilized the environments around him in order to create abstract compositions within the photos. He aimed to create surprising compositions by experimenting with imagery and the interactions of the urban environment around him. Man Ray also created works of art using photography, however he did so without a camera. Instead, in 1922 he created the rayograph, which utilized a very similar process to the cyanotype wherein artists would arrange objects on a photosensitive paper before exposing it. Man Ray, who was contemporary to artists like Duchamp, was fascinated with found objects, and this was how he decided to utilize them within the medium of photography. Moving on a few decades after the invention of photography, many photographers started to use the medium in order to bring public attention to social issues, such as suffering caused by war, poverty, and hunger. With the nature of the medium, especially during this time period, it lends itself to a more objective representation of reality, especially when compared to other forms of documentation like text or drawings. One such photographer, Jacob Rees, photographed the squalid living and working conditions in poor areas of New York, and then he published them, drawing public attention, which led to stricter housing codes and work safety laws. In general, people respond very differently to someone just saying, hey, this is what's going on, because you don't really know whether you can believe them or not. But when you see a photo like this, it's definitely harder to dispute and is more likely to elicit a call to action. Margaret Burke White was another artist pursuing social change through photography. She was the first American female photojournalist and the first Western photographer to photograph Soviet industry.
In the 1930s, she published photographic essays, which are a collection of photos on a single subject arranged in such a way that they tell a narrative or convey a certain mood or tone. Within hers, she documented industrial plants, construction projects, foreign customs, and Depression-era poverty. Ansel Adams was also doing this, but in regards to the environment and conservation. He wanted to highlight the beauty of nature and the need to protect it. In doing so, he created very striking, bold, sharp contrasted images by exposing some parts of the picture to more light than others. He worked with the United States Department of the Interior to produce photographs of the national parks, and he also founded the photography magazine Aperture. Invented in the early 1900s and more popular in the 1930s, color photography wasn't really accessible to the average person until the 1950s, wherein it became cheaper and more practical. So for the first century of the medium's existence, many artists are initially staying with black and white. One reason being, yes, the printing and the film were way more expensive. But in addition, color prints would often fade over time. And some photographers chose the black and white imagery solely for aesthetic purposes. To them, they believed that color lacked the abstract power of the black and white image, and they favored those formal qualities instead. As I mentioned, in the early 1900s, specifically 1907, we see the development of color photography. By 1932, Eastman Kodak Company makes color film. And as it became more accessible and affordable in the 1950s, by the 1960s, it's primarily associated with tourist and family snapshots because of the wide usage, which was a connotation that many artists really wanted to stay away from, so again, they stuck with the black and white photography. However, other artists, like William Eggleston, embraced color photography and its formal qualities, saying that his work would not carry the same effect if it was black and white. Using both the cultural context and the subject matter, he sought to elevate the ordinary by using color and high contrast. On to more contemporary times, we see artists starting to push the limits of the medium. Trevor Paglin is interested in contemporary questions about government secrecy, and in addressing this, he photographs secret government installations with the best photo equipment available to him. So he would get as close as he could to these facilities and photograph them with really advanced photo mechanisms. And while he yields fairly blurry images, they are far more descriptive than what's perceivable by the human eye. The example that we see here describes that he's 18 miles away and took the photo at 10.04 a.m. Utilizing large sheets of photosensitive paper, Susan Durges is able to take photos from the bottom of ponds. She does this by placing the paper in the bottom of a shallow body of water. If you look closely at this example here, you can see the little ripples of the surface of the water. In addition to taking her photos at night, she also experiments with artificial lighting, like shining a flashlight onto the paper through surrounding bushes. In doing this, she produces unique landscapes where the audience feels like they themselves are looking up at the water's surface from down below. Photographer Ben Don created his own form of printing photos, which he calls chlorophyll printing. In this process, he's able to print photographic materials onto plant matter. To do this, he attaches photos to leaves, places both of these between two pieces of glass, and exposes them to sunlight for several weeks. In doing so, the process of photosynthesis transfers the image onto the leaf. Coming from a family of Vietnamese immigrants, his work often uses imagery of Southeast Asian victims of warfare, producing haunting works that memorialize the dead. By the end of the 20th century, digital photography gained popularity. This allowed for infinite editing, and it really ruined photography's reputation as having objective truth. In addition, these new technologies allowed for endless reproduction, and this generally lessened the perceived specialness of photography for both consumers and makers. Some artists embraced the digital revolution and jumped into it, like Jeff Wall, who combined multiple photos to create a single photo that seems vividly real while also having a stagey, uncanny quality.
James Welling utilizes a combination of photos and photo editing software to really lean into the editing process. His works are usually composed of highly saturated colors and dynamic collage components, frequently featuring a figure in a dense background among splashes of rich digital color. As a result, the aesthetics reflect the process that created them. They look very digital. Now I want to introduce you to some contemporary artists. As usual, I'm not going to go very in-depth. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to all of them, and hopefully you find some interesting and we'll do some more research on your own. The artist that we see here is an indigenous Upsalika Crow, sculptor, fiber artist, performer, photographer, and videographer. Her artwork conceptually focuses on her heritage and challenging stereotypical imagery and understandings of indigenous people. The next artist is an American documentary and portrait photographer. She's also the co-author of MFON, Women Photographers of the African Diaspora, and a member of Kamoinge, which is a collective of African American photographers. Next we have another American who is a filmmaker and photographer. She uses appropriated imagery to respond to the media, particularly when analyzing identity and gender as a postmodernist and a feminist. The next artist is another American photographer focusing on personal identity and the history of race in America, particularly the invisibility of struggles faced by modern black Americans. To do so, she utilizes both models and herself as the subjects of her photos. Next we have a Slavic photographer working primarily in conjunction with luxury brands. She creates strange yet symbolic environments within her photos. American photographer focusing on portraits most famous for her celebrity portraits, like the one we see here of John Lennon and Yoko Ono, which was actually their last photo together. Here we see a Dutch photographer who utilizes the traditional genre of still life, but in a modern and humorous way that is still aesthetically pleasing. Now we see an Iranian multimedia artist working in video, film, and photography. Her work analyzes the religious and cultural roles of women in relation to Islam. This American artist documents her own life and the lives of those around her at their most vulnerable. Her works address topics like representation of the LGBT community, the AIDS epidemic, and addiction. Next we have an American photographer who creates his own elaborate cinematic and large-scale sets in order to stage his photographs, creating a sense of the ordinary that is still odd or unsettling, often using only one or two models in the photos to emphasize this setting. Here we see an Italian multidisciplinary artist. Utilizing a background in psychology, this artist creates works that straddle both criticism and confession and interrogates mass media. Next we see a Japanese photographer who confronts the Western art history canon by staging himself literally within it. Conceptually, he deals with personal and national identity, culture, and politics. This American artist uses video, photography, performance, and installation in order to examine feminism and black culture as they relate to representation and personal identity. This is a French photographer, videographer, and street artist. Utilizing this background in street art, he brings his photos into the world by installing them large scale and outside of the gallery. He primarily utilizes portraiture and is known for his photographs of eyes. Some of his works are interactive, wherein the audience can click on a certain photo and hear a voice recording of that person, and other works blur the line between photo and video as the figures have a slight movement to them. So what? Why does any of this matter? For starters, we are surrounded by photos all day every day. You probably take at least one photo a day. Whereas completing an entire painting is probably not a daily activity for you. That said, photography in itself, completely outside of art, is entirely integral to our culture and our understanding of life. Photography has an interesting duality to it. On one hand, it's an objective material. You have a subject, it's in front of the camera, you take the photo, you've captured the subject. On the other hand, it's also extremely subjective. The lighting, the composition, the perspective, all of those formal choices can change the way that the photo communicates. In addition, in the age we're in now, there's so much digital editing and photoshopping that it's really hard to know what we can and cannot trust. So there's an interesting relationship between fabrication and documentation that I think is really relevant right now. Though to varying degrees, 
There is an immediacy, a directness, and an intimacy to photography that is a bit unique. And no matter the extent of editing, there was a physical subject present, an artist with an intention, and a means of capturing both. And on that note, I'm going to conclude this lecture. So be sure to get enough sleep, stay safe, and I will see you all in class.